Once again, we welcome you to our second week in our season of Lent, our campaign on We Really Do Need Each Other. I hope that you have been inspired by the events this week. I hope you've been participating faithfully in the Sunday worship, in the daily devotions, and also in your small group Bible studies. I believe that God really wants to bless you. And so this week, as we begin our second week, I want to start with a scary place, and that's this world in which we live in. All you have to do is turn on the news and watch what's going on, and after a half an hour of watching the news, you would be so convinced that this world is falling apart, or as people often say, going to hell in a handbasket. Of course, people have been saying that and using that expression for many, many years. People all the way back in the Middle Ages and all the way back 2,000 years ago and 5,000 years ago probably felt the same thing. But when you turn on the news, you hear about the murder and wars and gun violence and hatred. You hear about political turmoil and intrigue, revolution and terrorism. Are you frightened yet? Certainly, when you come away watching that half an hour of the news, you certainly would believe that this world is spiraling into de to decay. But I want to give you some good news today. Are you ready for this? I'm going to give you some perspective. Something that you will never, ever hear on that one half an hour television program. Do you know that you are living in a safer age today than you have ever lived in your entire life? And I know, you don't believe it, you're ready to pull out the facts, that's because you're losing to too many peddlers of fear. Did you know that the crime rate in the United States of America is down by 50% from 1980? 50%. You would know that by listening to the peddlers of fear that you watch on TV. Did you know that wet deaths from war and violence is a fraction of what it was in the 1900s? A fraction. And you're probably thinking, oh, no, that's not true. Really? Do you remember World War I? Well, probably not. But you've at least read about it. Do you remember World War II? The Russian Revolution? Do you know 60 million people were murdered in the Russian Revolution? 60 million million. Get your head around that figure. Korean War, the Vietnam War, all of these were so obscenely violent times in our history of this world. The most violent times ever in the history of our world. We're not suffering through anything like that. Deaths from war and violence are down significantly more than what they were 50 years to 100 years ago. You are living six to seven years or more longer than what your parents lived. Our biggest problem today really isn't whether or not we're going to have a roof over our head and food in our bellies and safety in which to live our lives, but are we going to be too obese to enjoy our lives? That's the biggest problem facing our country today. So I'm not here to add to your fears. I want to give you some hope. Now, I do understand that there is a sense in all of us that, yes, the world has been touched by evil, but we are Christians, and we are meant to be counterculture, cultural. We have another message to give to the world, an alternate story, a new story, so to speak, that the world needs to hear. And I am asking you to be a part of that alternate news story. Here's the headline that we need to be flashing as Christians. This is, this is it. Are you ready? The world has been touched by good and by God. That's the headline, the big banner that we need to have for the world. It's not going to hell in a handbasket because this is God's world and God has touched it with good and by his loving hand. The author Reuben Welsh, remember this is, our, our campaign is based on a book that he wrote uh, 30 some, 40, actually more like 40 some years ago entitled, We Really Do Need Each Other, writes the following, We all know that the world has been touched by evil, but we must also believe that it has been touched by the life of God. I just want you to take a moment to make a confession to yourself, because I know you believe in this chaos of the world theory. I know that you believe that things are worse than what they were when you are growing up. It's just not true. The facts betray that. But I want to prove to you right now, even if you believe that this world is just falling apart and spiraling into decay and everything is so terrible in life, and you just believe that there's nothing good in this world, 
I am going to prove to you that you receive more blessings every single day than any bad things that happen. Here's how I want you to do it. I want you to take a moment, find your pulse in your neck, in your wrist. If your pulse is like mine, it's a pretty strong heartbeat. My beat's about 45, 40 to 45 beats a minute. It's slower than most people's. But for the average person, it's about 65, 70 beats per minute. So if you are the average person and you were to start counting those beats in a day, that would be 70 beats a minute. 70 times 60 minutes an hour, that figure times 24 hours in a day, your heart will beat over 100,000 times. You have just received today, just by living today, 100,000 blessings from God. And I bet you, you didn't even say thank you, did you? I want you to also take a moment Take a deep breath. Doesn't it feel good? You breathe 20,000 times a day. I've just enumerated for you 120,000 blessings that God gifts to you every single day, and you never acknowledge it, nor do you ever thank God for it. And yet you sit here and you gripe and complain about stubbing your toe. Oh, I got a story for you. Just momentarily, as I was setting up our scene for today's Bible story and lesson, I spilled wine all over the altar behind me. Oh, I'm telling you, Edna Malis, our, our, one of our altar guild ladies, is going to be so mad at me when she sees the, the linen cloth. I was mad. I will confess, I actually let a word slip that probably I'm not proud of. I was pretty upset with myself. And I got a little upset with God. God, I'm trying to get these lessons done. How could you do this? Oh, poor me. 120,000 blessings I get from God every day. And I spilled some wine and I was upset about it. Is a wine really that big of a deal over the altar? Well, I guess if you ask Edna, it probably is. That gives her more work to do, doesn't it? But I've just received 120,000 blessings in this last day, and I'm griping and upset about spilling wine on the altar. <clears throat> Here's the blessing. If you do not believe that God just is doing God's job to care for this world, if you really think this world is lost in chaos, I just want to smack you with a small pictureitis. You need to get rid of your big pictureitis real fast. You're looking at this bigness of this world and all the tragedies and you're compiling them as though it's happening all over the place into everybody all at one time. And it's not. There is, believe it or not, sufficient food produced in this world every single day to feed every man, woman, and child three square meals a day so that they are sufficiently fed and f uh, fed. There is enough clothing produced every day that every man, woman, and child has clothing on their back. There is sufficient housing that every man, woman, and child has a roof over their head and war is warm at night. Do you know what keeps them from getting warm at night? Because we're thinking in the big picture and we're thinking about how we need to uh, pass legislation, we got to do this, and all these things do is prevent food and clothing and shelter from getting to the very people that need to be blessed by it. It's because we try to think in big picture items, a uh, big picture, instead of the small picture and blessing the people that are sitting right in front of us. You want to do some good, don't pass a law, go and bless people who are poor and needy. We live in a world that is overflowing with the blessing of God. God has done his job for this world. God has blessed us with ample resources to feed the entire world, to bless each other ridiculously. And the reason why it doesn't happen isn't the fault of God. It's because of you and me. Because we prevent God's blessing from being distributed in this world. Now, that said, I want to give you some hope. I actually do believe that most people, 95 plus percent or more of the people in this world, 
are actually good people who want to be good. Now, they may not know the love of God, but they yearn to know the love of God. They yearn for God in their hearts. You want to know how I know this? Just use an illustration. There is a company in the United States called Honest Tea. Have you ever heard of it? About a year and a half ago, Honest Tea decided to try an experiment, starting in Minnesota. I believe it's a company based in Minnesota. But they wanted to take these free, or these uh, kiosks, uh, Honest Kiosks, the Honest System Beverage Kiosks, that they would put in cities all across the country. You could go and open a door and grab one of the Honest Tea bottles out and drink it right there. But there they also had a place to put your dollar. They said, if you, if you like the drink, if you want to drink, just put a dollar in our free kiosk. And I'm going to tell you what they found amazingly. After a lengthy experiment, 95% of Americans put in that dollar before they grabbed a drink. And some grabbed a drink, but they didn't have money, and they came back later and deposited money into the account. How amazing is that? I believe that people are good and want to be good because they yearn for God. That people want to be decent to each other. And it's only that small 5% or less that mean us harm and ill. Can you imagine what it would be like if we stood up and stopped focusing on all the tragedies and heartaches of life, started supporting each other, and standing up against those who are the naysayers? I want to read to you again from the book of 1 John. I know we read this last week. I'm going to read the exact same lesson. You notice in your Bible studies and devotions, daily devotions, you're reading the book of 1 John every single week, one chapter a day because I want you to live with this book and breathe this book. But let me read to you from 1 John chapter 1. We proclaim to you, John says, the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is the life itself, oh, listen to that. This one who is the life itself was revealed to us. We have seen him. Oh, there's no tragedy here. This is such good news. We now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things that you may fully share our joy. God has come to us in Jesus. That trumps every daggone thing you listen to on uh, those television shows and on those, uh, those news programs. You are listening to the wrong things. Instead of listening to talk radio, turn off the stinking talk radio. Turn off the news. Open up the Bible and be inspired by what truly is happening in this world. Because what the Bible says to us, there is no gap between Jesus and God. And there is no gap between us and Jesus. What does that mean? Jesus brings God to us. That's the good news. Jesus has come to bless us. Not just me, but to bless all of us. And so what we need to do is to avoid our over-individualization of our faith that infects those, so many sects of Christianity that dis causes us to despair and depresses us. You're so fixated on yourself, you need to open up your eyes to the blessing that God wants to do in this world. Look at what Reuben Welsh writes. He says, I think people like you and me are so grossly over-individualized. I think we have talked about personal salvation, individual salvation, about me and my, my inner life, until we become, until we've isolated ourselves. And so you know what your problem is? If you're sitting here thinking that this world is going to hell in a handbasket, your problem is, is you do not have an impression about the goodness of God. You do not understand how good God is and how good God has been to you. God, I've already proven to you, has given you 120,000 blessings today, in addition to the food 
and the friends who love you and the house and the roof over your head and the clothes that you have on your back. All of these are blessings from God. God is good and God has blessed you. And God is blessing the world. So maybe the problem isn't so much the, that the world is an awful place, but that we doubt because we have become isolated from God by our over-individualization. You're buying into the message peddled to you by sellers of anxiety and fear, talk radio hosts, news programs. Turn them off. You're listening to the wrong things. You're reading websites dedicated to peddling fear in your life. This is not of God and this is not how God sees this world. In so doing, you have isolated yourself from the truth, from the life of Jesus Christ, from the gift of Jesus Christ in the community of Christ, because Jesus meets us with love in the community of Jesus. I want to tell a story about a Methodist pastor, true story. He was at a retreat center one time, and there was a young man who was really filled with a great deal of anxieties and fears and started doubting his faith and feeling as though God really wasn't blessing him and the whole world was going to hell in a handbasket, and it seemed as though God wasn't doing anything about it. And so he came and he was confessing his doubts to the pastor and talking about how his faith was waning and getting cold, and the pastor just sat there and nodded and listened and listened, and then the pastor, while the boy, young man was talking, stood up and he got one of those shovels and, uh, uh, for the fire, and he went and, and pulled out one of the, the coals, you know, the hot coals from the, from the flame, you know, a piece of wood that was burning hot and red, and he set it on the mantelpiece, and he sat there and listened to the young man as he continued to talk. The young man was waiting for the pastor to say something. The pastor finally it got silent and was a little bit uncomfortable. The pastor didn't say a word, but he just stared at that little coal, that piece of coal that became, that was so hot and red. And then it became dark and black and cold. The pastor got up after a long, lengthy, uncomfortable silence, picked up that charcoal with his hand, flipped it around a few times, threw it back into the fire, where once it became, began, it became inflamed by the fire, and became hot once again, and started to burn. The pastor left, never said a word to the young man, let the young man figure out what the moral of the story. Do you get what the moral of the story is? See, here's the moral of the story. If you are feeling as though this world is just filled with such heartache and pain and awfulness and it's so terrible, if you think that God is just not doing anything about it, maybe it's because you've isolated yourself from the community of Christ where the truth is being spoken. Maybe it's because you're listening to too much talk radio and you've got the news on all the time and you're going and looking at websites that are dedicated to peddling all this fear and telling about all the awful things that are taking place in this world. This world is filled with good and with the love of God. And you are despairing because you have disconnected yourself from the life, the fire of other people. You become cold because you've been sitting on the mantel place, separated from the very thing that gives you life, the warmth and the fire of other people. You need to get back into the fire so that you, your heart may be filled with flames and love again. So here's my message for you today as you prepare for your small group Bible study. If you're going to be renewed and re-energized today, if you're going to find the goodness of God and get out of this despair and this cold part of your life where you just feel isolated and as though God doesn't care, you're going to have to do it by entering into the presence of other Christians so that their fire, their flame might inspire you. Let us pray. Gracious God, I'm praying for small groups as they prepare for their study today. Inspire them with your presence. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy your study today.